In part three of how to think about climate change, I talk about seeing the context clearly. It's the difference between arguing about trivia and high quality debate on the important issues. Well, let's have a look. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Change Making. This is part three in a five part series on how to think about climate change. One, scientific mindset. Two, the spirit of the debate. Three, seeing the context clearly, this one. Four, understanding our own limitations. And five, finding our way to a solution. And for this part, I'm going to deal with three themes. Framing the problem, human and political context, and historical context. So let's jump straight in. And the first part deals with framing. When you look at an issue, there are lots of ways to frame it. What some see as a problem, others see as an opportunity. What some see as a threat to the status quo, others see as a signpost of the future, and so on. The facts can be the same. How you interpret those facts can be wildly different. When debates have been going on for a long time, the perspectives of some of the protagonists become crystallised. And at that point, the frame through which they see the issue becomes as real as the issue itself. Let's take, for instance, an aspect of the debate around climate change, the question of the medieval warm period. The medieval warm period was a period where Europe, North America, and maybe other places as well, went through a couple of centuries of significant warmth. You can frame this in at least three ways. The protagonists on each side of the polarised debate have a framing. I have a different framing. One side frames the period like this. If we can show that it was a global phenomenon that had an overall average temperature higher or at least equal to today's temperature, then it's proof that the current warming is nothing unusual. And because of that framing, those people will argue vociferously that the 1998 hockey stick graph, which they feel downplayed the medieval warm period, was a fraud. The other side frames this period like this. If we can show that it was only a regional or hemispheric phenomenon that had a global average temperature lower than today's temperature, then it's consistent with a view that we're into the hottest period in recorded history, which underlines the importance of human-caused climate change and why we need to cut CO2 and so on and so on. And because of that framing, those people will argue vociferously that the 1998 hockey stick graph was correct, and in any case, it's been backed up numerous times by other studies which broadly agree with its overall conclusions. Now, both of those framings, never mind the facts behind them, the framings are self-referential. They arise from the polarisation of the viewpoints. They're given importance because of the argument. The third framing is this, the data about what happened in the medieval warm period with whatever uncertainties and minor contradictions that exist in the evidence are really interesting. They give us clues and insights into how the world works. They give us clues and insights into the impact certain things have on the habitats of humans and animals. They don't prove an argument. They provide information. If we stop trying to read things into what the information tells us in order to batter the other side into submission then we might learn some actually quite useful things. Because actually, what happened in the past doesn't prove anything about the present. Because the present is so significantly different. There are now 7 billion human beings on the planet, not a few hundred million. Human activity is massively more impactful today, obviously. And there's natural variation as well, all sorts of things. But it can inform us about some useful things. If the whole world was warmer in the medieval period, well, that's fascinating. Why did it happen? What can we learn from it? What happened then that we'd expect to happen now? What happened then that we're pretty confident wouldn't happen now? If, on the other hand, it was only part of the world that was warming, well, that's fascinating. How did it happen? Have we ever seen it happen globally? What does it tell us either way? It seems to me, if you're interested in the truth, that's for right framing, because it encourages you to look at the evidence with an open mind. Both of the other framings put you in front of the evidence, hoping it will go one way or the other. And with the best will in the world, it makes it harder to give due weight to any evidence that pushes in the opposite direction to your preferred route. Let's give some more examples. Certain climate change sceptics suggest they can read the minds of people on the other side Here's an example. 
and the problems for climate alarmists are getting worse. Sea ice growth so far in February has been the fastest since 1997. After decades of fear-mongering, this is quite a disaster for Arctic alarmists. The frame being presented here is that climate alarmists will think that it's bad news if there's more sea ice this year because it disproves their catastrophist view of the world. Or that climate alarmists want to pretend that there haven't been weather extremes in the past. Or that climate alarmists will be really cross if it's shown that polar bears are doing well and not on the verge of extinction. The logic of the position is that people on the other side would rather see the world in bad shape because it would endorse their worldview. Now I'd love to say that such a concept is just a mirage, a projection, a failed example of mind reading because, frankly, it's ridiculous. When you see a piece of good news about some aspect of climate change, if your response to that is to dismiss it angrily, then that's a bizarre counterintuitive response to good news. Unfortunately, I have encountered such counterintuitive behaviour reasonably often on this channel. It's a real frame amongst some on the other side of the fence. That said, I do think it's a minority frame and the attribution of such a frame to the mainstream, I think, is just lazy. Certainly the actual scientists don't think that way at all, as far as I can see. The campaigners can be another matter altogether. But of course, if someone projects that vision onto you and it doesn't fit, and they insist that you should defend yourself on the basis it's what you're supposed to believe, you should realise that they're trying to put the debate into a frame of their choosing for their purpose. Maybe it's the right frame, maybe it's exactly what you do believe and you're happy to defend it, but be aware of the power that framing has on how a debate is conducted. And framing isn't just about the extremes. All the information we get comes within a frame. The news headlines you'll see in the mainstream media. Let's take a look at a recent BBC News headline on climate change as an example. Take this one from just last week. A paper has been published suggesting that part of the US is into what's been described as a mega drought. It's argued that this effect is being exacerbated by climate change. These are the sorts of questions that partisans on both sides get very exercised about, and it's all about the framing. The principle here is straightforward. During the previous warm period that we've just discussed, a significant part of the US went through what is described as a mega drought, an extended drought over a significant period of time. I made some reference to this in my previous video about the history of climate change in the human era. Now we're entering into another warm period. And that raises an entirely valid question. Will the impacts of a new warm period play out in the same way as they did in the original one? People who are concerned about climate change above all else will point to this as a looming disaster and conclude that it's just another reason why society should support measures to reduce greenhouse gases. For them, the key pivotal point of the story is that the current mega drought, if it turns out that that's actually correct, that that's what's happening, is quite an important if, by the way, should be shown to be largely human caused. We should be to blame. For the sceptics, the framing is very different. They point at the history and they say, first of all, anything we're experiencing today is just the same as what's happened in the past. So it's nonsense to say it's human caused. Or at least, even if it is human caused, it's nonsense to suggest it's anything unusual that we should be concerned about. They may also point to maps like this one and say, look how small the modern bit is compared to the historical record. What are you getting upset about? Although in so doing, they're pointing to a graph that ends significantly before where we are today, so it's a cherry-picked argument. But that's not the important point here. Both of those framings are purely to do with the narrow, unproductive type of climate change debate. There is a third framing, which is to ask how likely is it that modern conditions will replicate what happened in history? And if it does, how should we best respond to reduce the impacts on our society? In other words, is the importance of the analysis really primarily a political one, where we have to give the attribution of the event more weight than the practical significance of the event? Because it's not that important as a political event. Whatever actually happens in one geographical territory neither strengthens nor weakens the case that we need to take action to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. But even if we reduce them to zero tomorrow, a practical impossibility by the way, it wouldn't make any difference as to whether a mega drought does or doesn't continue to unfold right here, right now. But the question about what we need to do to adapt, to prepare, well that could make a huge difference. Okay. 
Having mentioned the political aspect, let's move on to the human and political context. First, people debate the issue as though there's a single choice, and it's obvious and intuitive what needs to be done on either side. In most other fields, choices are rarely that simple. There are many different groups in many different situations, and every status quo and every proposed change to a status quo will have winners and losers. There may need to be trade-offs. There may need to be compromises. And sometimes there are genuinely hard decisions to someone's detriment, but to the overall societal benefit. The groups on the extremes in an intensely polarised debate are generally not troubled by those sorts of things. Because the winners are their people. And the losers are people with whom they have neither empathy, nor understanding, nor indeed patience. So for instance, the extreme environmentalists are very anti-corporate. The fat cats in the businesses enter the story only as polluters. And in order to explain the caricature role that they're supposed to play, they're said to be blinded by greed. Happy to knowingly condemn the planet to destruction in order to have their Lamborghini today. Or whatever it is. They're not just following incentives in a system not of their design. They're held to have knowingly made moral choices. Bad moral choices. The fact those people have children of their own and therefore a stake in the future, not considered a relevant factor. The fact they create jobs that benefit lots of people, the fact they come up with innovations to solve problems, the fact that many chief executives have been leading figures on looking at solving climate change issues and want their businesses to be part of a solution. In other words, the fact they may indeed have made moral choices, but simply see other elements to those choices that maybe you don't see, not given any weight. Now, of course, some do fail the test. There are plenty of perverse incentives in business and faced with such dilemmas, some will go one way, some will go another. Some will go the route of disgraced entrepreneur Philip Green. Some will go the route of sustainability champion Paul Polman. Most will be in the middle, just doing the best that they can. Oh, and one more thing that makes it even harder. Not only do we have to do the really difficult thing, we have to do it in the context of human imperfection. There have been no groups that perform brilliantly, consistently throughout human history. We have some brilliance, lots of mediocrity and some mendacity everywhere. That's the human condition. Arguably, the US Constitution was so successful precisely because the founders created a system to cope with human failings. So we have some companies breaking new ground on how you can be a brilliantly successful company and careful with your impact on society and on the planet. We have a bunch of mediocre companies doing kind of OK. And then we have others that honestly couldn't give a flying fig about the broken bodies. They just want the maximum short term return. We have some scientists who are highly ethical and doing brilliant work. Then we have a bunch of others doing generally OK work that helps fill in some of the details of stuff we didn't know. And then we will get some for whom their ego overrides the science. And yes, there are some who will game the system to get money or prestige, like Duke University, which last year settled for $112.5 million for repeatedly submitting research grant requests with falsified data. And we see everywhere else, by the way, political parties, charities. You know, there are people in charities who will move heaven and earth to try to make people's lives better. But there are also scumbags who will take advantage of people in desperate circumstances. So where does that leave us? It means we can't just take anything for granted. We do have to become aware of some of the human mechanics behind the scenes. We shouldn't put our trust completely in institutions, however worthy their stated aims, because they're run by fallible human beings. Incidentally, that doesn't mean that we should just believe in conspiracy theories, especially ones that seem to imagine a world where the conspirators are all really clever and capable of hiding their nefarious deeds. But also we shouldn't judge entire groups by the actions of their worst representatives. Surely we're sophisticated enough to cope with such a challenge. OK, finally, let's talk about historical context. Our understanding of what happened in the past is helpful for dealing with the present. So, yeah, it matters. But never forget that our understanding of history is always filtered through the perspective of the historian. Maybe the data and the evidence will tell you something about the, say, the climatic conditions of a particular era, 
but it's through the words of historians and diarists and storytellers that we learn what those conditions meant in terms of their impact on people, on animals and on food production. The novels Gone Girl and The Girl on the Train recently made the device of the unreliable narrator a fashionable device in fiction, at least for a while. But we ignore the fact that unreliable narrator is a pretty good description of any telling of history as well. It doesn't mean you should discount it. It just means you shouldn't accept it without some critical evaluation. At the same time, we should be aware of our tendency to project our frame onto history. This is something you see generally, for instance, the modern trend for judging historical figures according to the morality of today rather than the moral context of the time. But it's not just moral judgments. We tend to think, for instance, that history should repeat itself. We look back at historic droughts or historical storms. We see the death and destruction that they brought then and assume that that's a reflection of what would happen again if they happened today. And we shouldn't assume that couldn't be the case. If we learned how to prevent that sort of history from repeating itself, it was never through complacency. But the truth is, we often have massively reduced the negative impact of extreme events. We've learned how to build more robust structures that stand up better. We've learned to adopt early warning systems. We came to understand what we should do when we know an extreme event is imminent. Which is why the number of deaths suffered in, for instance, hurricanes and tornadoes in Bangladesh has gone down from tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in recent history to low hundreds in the most recent events. People think history repeats itself. It's kind of a meaningless concept because yes, it does. And no, it doesn't. And you get to decide which to focus on. If one time a drought comes and it leads to a famine, and then the next time a drought comes and it doesn't lead to a famine, well, the time after when a drought comes, guess what? One way or another, history is going to repeat itself. And then we'll notice the correlation and we'll draw grand principles from it. The fact that history repeats itself is a very limited value in terms of what it tells us. What we can do is we can learn the lessons as they come. Next time a pandemic hits the world, do you think we'll generally respond better than we mostly did this time? I'd think so, especially if it happens in the next couple of decades. And that's surely one of the important lessons you do get from history. By and large, human beings have shown ourselves capable of making terrible mistakes for sure. But generally, we respond to problems and we solve them. It's not an argument for complacency. For people who argue that the human race doesn't need to do anything because look how successful we've been in the past, those people are arguing completely contrary to the spirit that made us that successful in the first place. But it's an argument for optimism, fueling an interest in what really needs to be done. Beyond the context of the sterile debate between the extremes, looking instead to the evidence of the new challenges for new frontiers that we need to cross. So, the lesson from this chapter, part three, the facts are the facts. Whether you choose to see them in a useful context or a useless context, very much in your control.